I fell in love with the Walt Disney movie 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Not so much for the plot, but for the shape of that submarine. It was gorgeous. I don't know what Disney did. It doesn't look at all like the submarine in the various editions that Jules Verne was talking about. But boy, something about that shape is amazing. Plus the name, the name and the shape. And a year or so later in Hawaii, my mother took me to a shell shop. I was a little boy and I saw this sh shell, Nautilus. Well, that's not the submarine, Mom. Well, that's the real Nautilus. And there's something about that shape, that spiral, that entranced me. And I'm not alone in this. There are many people who study ammonites, the fossil closest relatives to Nautilus, who fall in love with this logarithmic spiral. There's a perfect, beautifully, mathematically regulated spiral shape. And I do believe you get hypnotized by it. At least in my case, I did. And before you got to college, you worked as a uh, professional diver? I put myself through college as a professional salvage diver and scuba instructor. And uh, it just seemed to be a perfect fit. I wanted, first of all, like all kids, to be a marine biologist to some extent. But really deeply inside me, I was always, always aiming at being a paleontologist. Uh, some of the really formative books for me were by Roy Chapman Andrews, all about dinosaurs, all about mammals, all about fossils. But it was really the great tales about going to the Gobi Desert and these fabulous American Museum of Natural History expeditions where they found the first dinosaur eggs. And just the romance of it. Just the romance of paleontology. I was smitten and have remained so ever since. So how would you get into oceanography studies? Uh, I, I was... Like all young kids, I wanted to be a dinosaur paleontologist, but actually I found marine fossils in Seattle when I was a boy and became interested as well. Plus, growing up in Seattle, you, you are surrounded by water. We had a vacation place right on in the San Juan Islands, which is by Puget Sound, and tide pools were these amazing things to me. I was just loved tide pools and loved the animals within. I kept trying to tell my dad, Put the camera in the water so I can get pictures of it. And this whole idea about salt water in his lens, you know, that, that argument did not did cut it for me. <laughs> that wasn't what I wanted to hear. So I guess it's just a perfect merging. What's your proudest achievement as a scientist? Um, well, I have an awful lot of achievements I'm not proud of. <laughs> I, never th I think it's that I have... I've been able to instill in some students that it's fun. I like what I do. I mean, I'm just, I like what I do, and I don't take myself very seriously. That what's well, fun? Science? Yeah. But that, that it, it works best if you view it as something, this is really fun, I'm enjoying this. It's a joyful activity. And to instill in them that science is a verb, not a noun, you know, it's an activity, you've got to go do it. It doesn't come to you, you go to it. There should be a sciencing verb, but a lot of my kids in, in uh, classes, you ask them, we ask them to define science. So it's a body of knowledge. No, it's not. Science is an activity. It's going out and refuting things. You know, you're a naysayer. That's what a scientist is. A good one is a naysayer. Multi-hypothesis multi naying. <laughs> so it sounds like you think that the connecting science to everyday life, to the culture that we all live in, is a noble goal. I don't know if it's noble, but I, I certainly think it's, it's, it's a required goal. I think, I think that it's required to me because if we do that, all of our qualities of life improves and increases. Uh, people ask me, how long will humanity last? And I always ask back, well, last, yes, we might last, but will we be happy? You know, and they, I say, I think we're extinction proof. And they say, oh, that's great, we'll last forever. And I say, we may be extinction proof, but we're, we're also, we're not misery proof. And that, for instance, the more and more and more of us there are, the more miserable we all become because standard of living is going to drop every place. So, yeah, we could last a very long time and be really unhappy with that long time. It's, I've never heard anyone say science is a goal, road to happiness. Well, if, if you're a curious person, it certainly is. It's just another way of scratching that curiosity itch. But I mean, where are the big breakthroughs that make our life easier and better? 
and give us time to do the stuff that does make us happy. Science doesn't. Science and engineering, but mostly science. I mean, it was really scientists that told the engineers how, why to build this and not this, and how this works and that doesn't. Airplanes fly this way, airplanes take you to warm, sunny places, there's happiness, right? <laughs> Some scientists came up with the airplane idea. So there's, yeah, I think it's a road to happiness. As an astrobiologist, paleontologist, marine biologist, seen so many species throughout the geological eras, what makes human beings unique? Oh, the intelligence. And uh, we were speaking earlier, to me, a hallmark of intelligence is being able to predict, predict the future, see what's coming. Uh, seeing what's coming, it really takes a great deal of intelligence to see what's coming, to, to accurately predict. This is what makes why great chess players are very rare, too. There's that word again. Uh, great chess players are able to think ahead through the multiple possibilities and see clearly pathways. But they're always multiple, it's contingent futures, if this, if this, if this, if this. That takes a lot of intelligence. One move ahead, you're starting to look at all the, the possibilities because the, the pieces on the board, there's a finite number of possibilities. But what about the second move after that where you have to go through those possibilities at a highly second level? So that's where you get really different, and great chess players can look way ahead. See, that's a level of intelligence. I, I have a hard time. You've never imagining. seen that in other animals, whales, dolphins. I mean, that, this is human intelligence. This is by far, in in the ability to predict the future, we're the best of all. Uh, my cat, who's up here meowing, will we'll sit in front of a mouse hole. The cat, from past experience, knows there will be a mouse sooner or later there, but the cat may not go into the point knowing that mice take a siesta from 11 to 2 and therefore he won't have to worry about the cat, the mouse and won't be there. See, the, the complications of it aren't with him. Whereas a human, knowing there would be coming, would might take that understanding and then use that to actually predict not only that mouse hole but all the other mouse holes around it to maximize yield. There's just, and it's not only this year, you know, a year from now that that might actually work. You, you really have this fantastic ability to look into the future. Are humans going to make it as long as the Nautilus? That's a good question. The Nautilus itself, the genus, has been around 200 million years. I've always consistently run into problems with press when I try to say that I think humans are essentially extinction proof to everything except, I mean, the totally out out of whack cosmic accidents. Again, where a giant a comet <laughs> comes down and hits you. Bruce Willis would not be able to save us from hail bomb. There is no technology on this planet that could stop a 40 or 50 kilometer comet coming at you, not at 25 kilometers an hour, which shows an asteroid does, but 75 kilometers an hour, bigger, faster. No, you're, you're cooked. Right. Did your, does your conviction about life being rare on Earth evolve out of your um, experience in paleontology? I mean, has knowing how Earth really evolved given you authority to say that we are extremely rare, or how has it given you authority to say we're really rare? Well, there's, there's certainly a lot of, of aspects about studying the past that uh, is, is, is very useful to this. The mass extinctions, I think, they certainly don't put me in a unique situation, but they certainly educate me in ways that hadn't really been looked at before. Your life, my life, anybody's life, there's only two alternatives. You die of old age or you die early from unexpected happenstance. Hit by a car, you catch a disease, you get caught up in a war, you get squished. And that's the fate of planets. You know, it can go to old age or it gets wiped out. Well, the wiping out part, um, it clearly happens. I mean, there, there are clearly cases where planets are being, their life is essentially wiped out. And you think, oh, another big planet hits them. No, it had hail Bop hit us. hail Bop was a great big comet. Was it 97? Somewhere back there. There would not be any surface life on this planet, and it very well could have killed off all of the subterranean life as well. So that's, hail Bop was about 40 kilometers in diameter. It's only four times bigger than the, the asteroid that hit us and killed off the dinosaurs. So the fact that we haven't been hit is even further evidence that we're rare? 
Yeah. Really? Oh, yeah. I mean, the, we're not just rare, we're mucky. Huh. You know, we shouldn't have called it a rare earth, we should have called it a mucky earth. Because any of us there, but for the grace of God, if you want to say it that way, that you weren't killed by something, you didn't even know it was coming. You know, how many times you walk across traffic or just some odd circumstance where, oh, gee, you know, if I'd been a minute earlier or later, I'd be dead. Planets, too, and life histories.